It turns out that there are a lot of ways to modify the Atwood machine problem in order to make it more interesting and a little more complicated. So one way that we can modify the problem is we can have one object that is sitting on a surface like this, um, and it can have a string that's running over a pulley, like so, um, and then another object that is hanging below. So I'll call this M1 and M2. So um, in this case, the behavior is going to be really similar to what we had in the ordinary Atwood machine, but the solution is just going to look a little different because the setup is a little different. Okay, And in this case, let's also incorporate friction. So if we assume that in between the um, surface of block one and whatever this table is, um, we have some known coefficient of kinetic friction, uh, maybe it's 0 0.1 or something, we can then solve the problem. And in fact, let me put some numbers here. So maybe this um, object is five kilograms and this one is 10 kilograms. Um, and we want to find what is the acceleration of this thing um, once it starts moving. Okay, so the setup is really similar to what we did before. We want to start by drawing some free body diagrams. So for M1, we have a gravitational force on one by the earth, a normal force on one by the table. There's a tension. So this will be tension force on one by the string. There's a friction force on one by the table, which I'm drawing smaller. I'm assuming that this object is going to accelerate to the right. Okay, and that appears to be everything. Then for object two, we have a gravitational force that's bigger because the object is bigger. So G2E and a um, tension force on two by the string, which I'm assuming is smaller than the gravitational force because I'm expecting the object to be um, moving downwards. Um, and not only that, but accelerating downwards as well. Okay, so once we have the free body diagrams um, drawn, then what we want to do is um, use Newton's second law to write out some relationships between the various um, quantities. So I'm going to start with the easier one that appears to be the one on the right. So Newton's second law for mass two, um, we only have to worry about one direction. I'm going to choose downward to be the positive direction here because that's the direction I'm expecting everything to accelerate. Okay, so if I do that, then I have G2E, um, which is downward, minus T2S, which is upward. So minus because it's in the negative direction. That's going to equal mass two times the acceleration of object two. Okay, now looking at object one, we have two different directions we have to consider. So I'm going to choose x positive to the right and y positive upwards. Okay, so um, if we consider the x direction, then we have t1s in the positive x direction minus f1t in the negative x direction equals mass one times acceleration one. Uh, in the y direction, we have normal force upwards minus gravitational force downwards. Those equal mass times acceleration, which in this case is zero because it's not accelerating vertically. It's only accelerating to the right. Okay, so um, using a little bit of, um, um, well, taking an inventory first of what we need to know, um, we have two different accelerations, two tensions, two masses that are given, um, and a normal force that we don't know. So there's a lot of stuff we need to figure out, but we can use some of the same um, tricks that we used before. So if we assume that the pulley is massless, then we can use that T1S equals T2S because it's the same string. We just have um, a turn when it goes over the pulley. We'll assume that the pulley is a good pulley, and so the tension stays the same. We can also assume that A1 equals A2 because we'll assume that the string is inextensible, so it's not stretching, um, and so that will simplify things a little bit. We can also use that G1E equals M1G, G2E will equal M2G, um, and so um, we can add those things to our relationship. All right, so the, one, the, the equation we have where we know almost everything is the Y equation for uh, mass one, and so if I plug in the um, known information, I get that N1T equals M1G because the gravitational force is just M1G. Okay, so now we know that normal force. Um, and if I rewrite the things that I know now, I have tension. Well, I only have one tension in this problem, so I'll just call it T minus the friction force, one T equals M1A. And then for the other um, object, I have the gravitational force, which will be M2G minus the tension equals M2A because they have the same acceleration. Okay, um, so I still have an acceleration I don't know, a tension I don't know, and a friction that I don't know. So I have three unknowns in two equations. So what's the relationship between friction and anything else? Well, what we know is that the kinetic friction is equal to mu k times the normal force. And in the problem, we're assuming that we know what that coefficient of kinetic friction is. And so um, we can then use that because we know what the normal force is. So the coefficient, or sorry, the, the value of the kinetic friction is going to be mu k times the normal force, which is m1g. Um, and both of the, the um, normal force and the friction we're looking at have the same subscripts, so that's a nice check that everything is working the way we want it to. Okay, so I'm going to plug that value in, and so I get tension minus mu k times m1g equals m1a. So I just took the tension minus friction equals mass times acceleration and plugged in my expression for the friction. Okay, so now we know everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
add together these two equations to cancel out the tensions. Again, you wouldn't have to do that. You could instead solve for tension and plug it into the other one and then solve for acceleration, but that turns out to be a lot more work. Okay, so when I add these two equations together, I'm going to have m2g minus mu k m1g, and I have negative tension plus positive tension, so those cancel out. Then on the right-hand side, I have m2a plus m1a. All right? So then solving for acceleration um, is going to mean that I have to factor out acceleration on each side. So I'm going to factor gravity on the left-hand side and acceleration on the right-hand side. So m2 minus mu k m1 times g equals m2 plus m1 times a. And then solving, I get a equals um, m2 minus mu k times m1 over m2 plus m1 all times g. Okay, so that is my answer. And notice, I solved the entire problem using variables. Even though in the original problem, I had some numbers. I had values for mu k, for the masses, um, and so on. I didn't plug those in until the very end. So now that I have this solution, this is the point where I would plug in the values for those things to get an answer. Why is that good practice? Well, for one thing, um, if you plug in numbers as soon as you get them, if you make a mistake, you'll never find it. You'll have to start over from the very beginning. Um, whereas here, if your answer doesn't really make sense, you'll be able to trace back through your work a little more easily. Also, um, if you, for instance, assumed that the object was moving, but then it turns out that the friction is bigger than tension or something, um, you would have to start over if you were plugging in numbers the whole time. But um, it'll be easier to see how to adjust your, um, your work if you have the variables still at this point. And again, you can check your work in a few other ways, because you could say, all right, well, what happens if M1 is zero? Does this have the acceleration I expect? What happens if um, M2 is really big? Then does that have the acceleration that I expect? So um, this allows you to check your answer in a variety of ways. Um, okay, so I want to just set up another example, but not solve it completely, because it will take a little while. Um, but this will be something that you can try on your own. So let's say that we modify the Atwood machine in another way. Let's say that we have a ramp like this with some angle, and perhaps the angle is known. And we have a mass like this with a pulley um, and another mass that is hanging here. Um, so again, the problem is the same as it was before. We want to solve for the acceleration of the system. And again, we can assume that there is friction, and maybe we know what the kinetic friction is in this case. So the strategy for solving this looks exactly like the strategy for the other examples. We want to draw a free body diagram for M1 and for M2. The one for M2 is going to look much the same, so I'm not going to repeat that one. But M1 is a little different this time. So we have a gravitational force on M1 by the Earth. We have a normal force that's now at an angle on one by the ramp. And we have a friction force on one by the ramp. And we have a tension. OK, so maybe we don't know which direction friction is when we start. So I drew it up the ramp, but maybe someone else would have drawn it down the ramp, which I think actually down the ramp is probably correct. Um, and it's not obvious ahead of time Oops, um, which way that is. So let's say that um, one person drew it up the ramp and another drew it down the ramp. That actually works out OK. So what will happen if you do that is just at the end when you try to calculate the friction, you would get a negative number. And so it would be immediately clear that that happened. Um, you know, in going through the, the problem, that actually is something that can happen quite a bit. That, like, you might not know which direction something is. It'll just come out to be negative if you guess incorrectly. Um, OK, so we have, then, um, a tension on one by the string and a friction on one by the ramp. And there's a lot of stuff going on here. This basically incorporates everything. So this is about the hardest problem that uh, an Atwood machine could be. So to solve it, though, looks much the same. You're going to write down Newton's second law equations, probably choose your coordinates so that x is up the ramp and y is um, perpendicular to the ramp. But then you will relate all of the forces in the x's uh, in the x direction and the y direction to the accelerations in those directions, um, and then relate the tension on m1 to the tension on m2. The accelerations are the same, and you can solve. Okay, so it's going to be a little more complicated because there's a little more going on, but the basic procedure looks just like it did for the uh, previous example.